we're in our, uh, our little series called The Love of God Changes People. And it really does change people. Changed me, changed many of you. Today I want to talk about the fact that we, and I'm speaking personally here, I love God because He's done so much for me. And that's what you ought to be saying, is I love God because He's done so much for me. 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 through 19. So we've come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been made perfect in love. We love because He first loved us. We're called to be lovers of God and lovers of people. Before we can love people, God wants all Christians to understand His great love for them. God wants us to understand, or at least to get a glimpse of the magnitude of His love for us. Now, I think that some churches have taken that too far, and all they talk about is the love of God, and He is love, but not to the exclusion of His other attributes. But for our our discussion today and for the sermon today, we do want to focus on the love of God. In verse 16, I'll read that again to you. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. We have these two words, to know and to love. And they're used in such a way that they are inseparable Christian verbs. They're action words. To know is a verb. Therefore, it's not something that happens to us. It's not something that explains us. It's something that we pursue. And belief is a verb. Belief shows action. We can't just be passive about knowing. We can't be passive about believing. They're action words. And it's a call to action. In Scripture, these two words, to know and to believe, are are linked together in different texts. And, And we find Peter answering the Lord when Jesus had made a a difficult statement. And the crowds deserted him. And he turned around, looked at his disciples, and said, are you going to leave me too? And Peter's response in John chapter 6, verses 68 and 69 is, uh, he answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And so Peter links belief and knowledge together because they're inseparable. You can't believe in what you don't know. And you can't really know what you believe unless you know it. You've got to study it. They're not abstract. They're inseparable concepts or inseparable verbs for us. We believe and we know. One commentary said this, When one abides in the love of God, his knowledge of God grows, and his faith in God grows. The more we love him, the more we understand him. And in turn, we trust him more, and our faith increases. The more we know about God, it should elicit from us this love response. We have to be in love with the Lord. It doesn't mean that it's some 
mushy feeling that we have like we fall in love with someone. It is the more we love, or the more we know him, the more we are live in a life of gratitude and love for who he is and what he's done. But John uses another interesting word. He says, so we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. You would think that's kind of a common word, and it is, but we don't stop to think about it. The word us in this context shows exclusiveness. John is not talking about God's love for the lost. He's focusing on God's love for those whom he has redeemed, his children. This word is in the first person, and it is a plural pronoun. First person means Paul's including himself in the group of us. And he's saying, look, I have come to know and believe the love God has. And and I'm assuming that all of us as Christians or followers of Jesus have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. Because it's kind of an emphatic statement. We have come to know the love that God has for us. We've come to believe the love that God has for us. And if you don't know the love of God for yourself, if you're not yet a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, you've not yet become part of that exclusive circle. And people say, well, Christians, they they think they're kind of exclusive. And in, in one way, they're right. We are. But we don't exclude others by our choice. God excludes them based upon lack of faith in Christ. But when we humble ourselves and submit ourselves to Jesus Christ, we're now included in Christ and excluded from the world. You can't be both in the world and in Christ. They're they're mutually exclusive. To give you an idea of how mutually exclusive this is, we'll look at it from a negative perspective and how it's used in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 29, Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee to the Gadarenes, Gerasenes or Gergesenes, however your translation has it, and he was met by a demon-possessed man. One translation, or one, one uh, of the gospel says two demon-possessed men. And he was met by this one man who called himself Legion. And Legion was demon-possessed by a multitude of demons. And the demons recognized Jesus. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us? O Son of God, have you come here to torment us before the time? Now the us, the the demon-possessed man is speaking. So if we're not careful, we will include him in the us. He's not part of the us. It's a mutually exclusive group, and the us is the demons. There's a separation that takes place. And the demons are separated from the man. They go into the herd of pigs, they run down, and they're drowned in the sea. The man is left alone, proving that he was not part of the us. When when John is talking to Christians, he talks about the love that God has for us. It's an exclusive group. It's just Christians he's talking to. And what he's saying is, God loves Christians in a very special way. In a way that he doesn't love the lost. He loves the lost, but not like he loves his own children. God's love for the lost is different from his love for Christians. It's different. He loves them, but in a different way. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. If you've got your Bible, we'll read down through that. 
1 John 4, 9 through 12. Notice the exclusiveness of the words that, that John uses here. Beginning at verse 9, In this the love of God was made manifest among, among who? Among us. That God sent His only Son into the world so that, who? We might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in... See these exclusive words that He's using to show He's just talking to Christians right now. He's, he wants Christians to focus in on all that God has done for them. Christians are an exclusive group, not because we designed it that way, but because the Father designed it that way. And we need to understand the privilege that we have of being in the family of God, of being followers of Jesus Christ. And then he says that all Christians have to have a special relationship with God um, through abiding we have a special relationship with God. We have a relationship with God that the world doesn't have. This word abide means to continue in an activity or a state, to continue, to remain in, to keep on. When we abide, we don't move from where we are to some other place. We just stay where we are, and the, the staying where we are is in a particular thing. Again, verse 16, if you've got your Bibles open, you can take a look there. He says, God is love, and whoever abides in what? In love. Well, that's kind of weird. If you abide in love, you abide in God. And God abides in Him. Well, how, how do you wrestle with that? Well, let's talk about uh, abiding in love a second, and it's not in your notes, but we'll just walk through this. When we abide in love, the love that we have is not the kind of love that the world has. It's a love that starts with the premise that God is love. There's a special kind of love that Christians ought to have. We're going to flesh this out a little further as we go on. But all Christians ought to be abiding or walking in love. The demeanor of Christians should be love. Our attitude toward people ought to be love. Even if we're disciplining our children, we should discipline them in love. So the overriding character trait of Christians is love. Not antagonism. Not belittling or tearing down someone else. Not judgmental toward others. But love. Because God is love. When we abide in love, we abide in Him. We abide in Him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in Him, so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from Him in shame at His coming. We are called to abide in Him. As we walk throughout our day, we ought to be walking in fellowship with God. All day long, walking in fellowship with God, abiding or remaining in Him. John chapter 15, verses 9 and 10. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. So John's saying the same kind of thing in 1 John and in John. He's saying abide in love. We're, our, our character trait as Christians should be loving. Not harsh, not demeaning, not critical, not judgmental, but loving. We've got to be characterized by love. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, 
Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love, Jesus said the two great commandments are to do what? Love God and love others. That's how we abide in love. We love God and we love others. The character trait for Christians ought to be love. When we abide in Him, we abide in love, we abide in Him, He abides in us. He remains in us. Now, this is not a proof text that you can lose your salvation because you can't. The reality is, this is a proof text to know whether or not you really are in Christ. Are you loving? Are you judgmental? Are you condescending? Are you keeping a record of wrongs and bitter? God's people are characterized by love. He abides in us then. 1 John chapter 2, verse 24. Let what you've heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. Well, what did you hear in the beginning? We're to love. And God loves us. And we're to walk in light as He is in the light. We're to have fellowship with one another. It's all about loving relationships. 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. Again, the, the whole character trait of Christians is that there's this overwhelming love in us for what God has done for us that flows out into the lives of other people. We are to be loving to God and to others. See, the proof that we're abiding in God and God is abiding in, in us is that we love one another like or in the same way that God loves us. That's the proof of Christianity. The proof of Christianity is not in how much theology I know, how many verses I've memorized, can I say all the books of the Bible in order. The proof is, am I loving God and am I loving others? Now we come to the hard part. All Christians must have a perfect love. A perfect love. Verse 17. By this is love perfected within us, or with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as He is, so also are we in the world. Our love is to be perfected. I have a long way to go. How about you? Our love is to be perfected. The word perfect means to cause to be truly and completely genuine. Don't you love it when, when people fake nice? Can you tell when people are, are really faking nice? They're, not, they're not, not really nice to you. They just want you to be quiet, get out of their life move on to the next person so they can get on with whatever they're doing, and they're just faking nice to get rid of you. Christians aren't to fake nice. We're to really be nice. Our, our love is to be truly and completely genuine, to make genuine, to make true, to make completely real, to be complete or fully developed. The Christian love is to be fully developed within us. God's love is to be so developed within us that it naturally flows out of us toward others. Perfect in this context is an interesting word in that it is in the perfect tense. So perfect is in the perfect tense, meaning that love has been made genuine or complete and exists in its finished result. In other words, as a Christian, you and I, or as Christians, you and I have all of the love of God within us. We're to abide in that love. We cannot get more of the love of God. We have all of the love of God we're going to get, and as such, it's complete. It's 
full in us. The issue is we're not letting it ooze out of us to others. What we need to do is be so in tune with God that when we're abiding in love and God is abiding in us and we're, we're abiding in Him, that it so overwhelms us that the natural response to trouble and troubling people is love. We love them. We have to love difficult people. Not like we go out and search for them. They will find you. They really will. Difficult people will find you. They are God's appointment for you to allow the love of God to flow through you into their lives. You see, they're not so much to test you, though that's part of the equation. They're there for you to influence them through the love of God. I'm convinced that we need to open our mouths and speak more about Jesus Christ and His sacrifice for people. But more than that, we need to let the love of God flow out of us toward them. I think people are tired of seeing the hypocrisy of Christianity where we're mean-spirited and antagonistic, and yet we want them to know the love of God. There, there's a disconnect there. In our debates, in our conversations, in our theology, and in our teaching, we need to teach the truth. But it always needs to be the truth in what? Love. Paul said that in Ephesians chapter 4. Speak the truth in love. Not, not in antagonism or judgmentalness or complaining. In love. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14, this same word is used, and in the ESV it's translated mature. He says, the writer of Hebrews says, but solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So in, in the teaching and in the preaching, we can give solid food or the deep spiritual truths to people who are mature perfected, made complete. In the same way, the love of God needs to flow through us as we mature in the Lord. Another place that's used, James chapter 1, verse 4. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's what our love ought to be, ought to be like. Our love should be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Only through an abiding love can we have a genuine love. When we abide in the love of God, and we abide in God, and God abides in us, our love for God and our love for others will be genuine. It won't be fake. Many Christians come to church, they sing about loving Jesus on Sunday and act as though they don't love Him throughout the week because they complain about this, that, and the other thing or they're judgmental or they're cynical or they mock things. And what we need to do is we need to get rid of all that stuff, repenting of it, turning from it, and letting the love of God flow through us to the others around us and to God. When we do that, the testimony of Jesus Christ is ramped up. The light shines brighter. And people see God more clearly. So only through an abiding love can we have a genuine love. John 17, verse 21. Jesus in His high priestly prayer prayed this. I made known to them your name. Whenever he says that, when he's saying, I made known to them your name, it's not like, oh yeah, your name is Yahweh. No, I let them know your name, and it carries with it all of your character traits. Your name. And I will continue to make it known. Why? That the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Jesus Christ wants us to know all about God's character because when we know all about God's character, we understand the love the Father has for the Son 
and the love that the Son has for us and the fact that the Son is abiding in us. We have so much in God and in Christ that how can we not love others? We need to be the most loving people on planet Earth. An abiding love gives the Christian great confidence at the judgment. You see, it's, it's more than just what happens right now. It gives us a great confidence at the judgment. Judgment day is one day closer than it's ever been. It's one day closer than it's ever been. And we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the things done in the flesh or in the body, whether good or bad or evil. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10 talks about that and tells us there's a day of accounting that we're going to have to stand before. We're going to stand before the great judge and we're going to have to give an account. By being loving, we have great confidence at the day of judgment. One commentary said, the clear message is that the love one has for God has an effect on the future. The confession of Jesus as Lord and the mutual abiding between God and the believer allow for God's love to have its full expression. Let me flesh that out for you a little bit. What he's saying is, when we abide in the love of God, we begin to really comprehend and understand the love of God, the love that God has for us as Christians. When we begin to understand that, comprehend that, and it gets into us, and we walk in that, we abide in that, it is naturally going to flow out of us. When it flows out of us, we will open our mouths to confess to others. When it flows out of us, we will be peacemakers who sow a a harvest of righteousness and peace. We will be the kind of people who reap the benefits of being a Christian. And on Judgment Day, we'll have have nothing to be ashamed of because the love of God flowed out of us to others and we were confident witnesses for Him. The reason that we lack confidence in our witnessing is that we love people and their approval more than God. And so we shrink back from testifying for him. What we need to do is we need to begin to love God properly so that we can love others properly. As we do that, the testimony of Jesus Christ is enhanced. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. See, when we come, we'll be able to stand there crying out, Abba, Father, Daddy. Instead of wondering, was I pleasing to him? We will have spent our lives seeking to be pleasing to him. Kenneth Wiest in his word studies studies of the Greek New Testament, said this, and it's too long to put on a slide. I'll just read it to you. He said, this is not primarily God's love for us or our love for God, but the love which God in His nature produced in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The saint who in the future rapture of the church will approach the judgment seat of Christ with boldness, freedom of speech, is the saint who in his earthly life has had the love that God is that God is in his nature brought to its full capacity of operation by the Holy Spirit in his life. That fullness of love results in a life devoted entirely to the Lord Jesus. When we love God and understand the love God has for us, why would we not live fully for him? It would be a natural thing for us when we are overwhelmed with the love of God to let it permeate our lives. See, the Christian's identity is in Christ, not in the world. Our identity is in Christ, 
not in the world. One other commentary said, Believers who love one another in this world in the same way as Christ loved his disciples when he was in the world show that they live in God. And therefore, they need have no fear as they face the day of judgment. When we have a life permeated with love, oozing with the love of God for, for him and for others, when we have that kind of a life, it creates confidence on the day of judgment. We don't go through life fearing. We're confident that we have a life in God and He is in us. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Or chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, sorry. Hebrews 10, verses 34 to 36. Let me back up to verse 32, actually. 32 to 36. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to, rebuke, to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. The, the real issue for us is there's a day coming, and we should have confidence in that day. But when we store up treasures on earth, where moth and rust corrupt, where we love the world more than we love God, where we love people more than we love God, where we seek their approval more than we seek God's, on the day of judgment, there's great fear. Not a fear that we're going to be cast into a hell, but a fear that we've disappointed our Savior who loved us and gave himself for us. Here's the, the truth that, that John is laying out. The more Christians love, the less they fear. The more we love, the less we fear. When we love God more, when we love others more, not for what they can do for us, but because it's God's love flowing through us, the less we fear what will happen to us. 1 John 4.18 There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. In this context, fear and love are mutually exclusive. They, they can't coexist. One drives the other out. Where we have a sinful fear, it drives out godly love. Where we have God's love flowing through us, it drives out sinful fear. They cannot coexist together. If we are fearful, it means that God's love is not abiding in us and we're not abiding in his love. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Some translations say, and a sound mind. God is not the author of fear. He, he didn't design it. He doesn't want us living in it. It's not a part of the Christian character. It's not a part of God's character. Therefore, as the character of God is developed in us, we need to allow the love of God to shine through us, which alleviates and eliminates fear. John Walvoord said, fear carries with it a kind of torment that is, it, that is its own punishment. Ironically, an unloving believer experiences punishment precisely because, precisely because he feels guilt, guilty and is afraid. Fearful people are punished by their fear. 
loving people are set free from fear and its bondage, and they can love without fear. What we need to do as Christians is understand how fear is cast out by perfect love. Fear casts, is cast out by perfect love. If you want to be less afraid, there are no techniques that make you less afraid. There's desensitization. Desensitization. You know what I'm talking about. Some, somebody say it. Yeah, you didn't do any better than I did. Uh, it, we, there, there's a psychological thing where we desensitize people by putting them in places where these objects are. If you're afraid of snakes, they will put you in close proximity to snakes until your fear is alleviated. If you're afraid of bats, they will put you in close proximity to bats so that your fear is eliminated. Whatever you fear, they put you in close proximity to that to break down your uh, um, fear of that. That's not God's way of dealing with fear. God's way of dealing with fear is to love more. Because the more you love, the less you fear. Because fear is driven out by love. This word cast out or phrase cast out means to drive out or to turn out of doors. Sometimes your kids are driving you crazy in the house. You say, just go outside. You drive them out. That's kind of the idea here is you get them out of that element. In a positive way, Jesus was telling this to his disciples. John 6, verse 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive out. I will never cast out. The love of God is so strong that those whom the Father gives to the Son, the Son never rejects. Man, does that give you confidence? That just helps me understand the great love that God has for me. John chapter 15 and verse 16. In a negative way. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. That term, thrown away, is the same words used for cast out or driven out. Our responsibility as Christians is simply to abide in the love of God. To abide in love, to abide in God, and God abides in us. Lou Priolo in his book, Helping, or in his article in the Journal of Modern Ministry, in an article entitled Helping People with Crippling Fear, said this, there's an interesting corollary in the Bible between sinful fear and selfishness. People who are selfish tend to be fearful. People who are fearful are necessarily selfish. Perhaps the best way to, to demonstrate this is by studying the antithesis of both sins. According to 1 John 4.18, 4, the opposite of and remedy to sinful fear is love. Love more. Let the love of God permeate your lives, abide in that love, and let it flow out to others. Not in some gushy, mushy, emotionally tripping type of a, a relationship, but the love of God that wants people to come to God, that wants to minister to people, to, to serve others. The fearful person reveals a lack of love. For God. The fearful person reveals a lack of love for God. My, my goal through this study is to show that God loves us, and it's our responsibility to love Him back. 
That's the natural response of people who have been overwhelmed by the love of God to love Him back. John chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. And there was much muttering about Him among the people, while some said, He's a good man. Others said, No, He's leading the people astray. Yet, for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of Him. It's easy in a safe environment to say we love Jesus. What about a harsh, hostile environment? Are you willing to say you love Jesus? What if, what if it's going to cost you your job? Are you willing to say you love Jesus? What if it's going to cost you relationships? Are you willing to say you love Jesus? Has the love of God so overwhelmed you that the only response you can have is demonstrating that love to others? That's what we're called to do as Christians. John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. Again, another negative example. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. Well, they, they believed in him. They believed he was the coming Messiah. But for fears of the Jew, fear of the Jews, they did not confess it. Why? So that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from man. From God. What hinders us from pleasing God is that we want something greater in our lives than God and His love. We don't let the love of God permeate the world around us because we want people's approval more than we want God's love demonstrated to them. And what we need to do is repent of that. We need to begin to be overwhelmed with the love of God, and we need to let the love of God so permeate us that it flows out into our community, into our church, into the lives of those that we come in contact with. Lack of perfect love leads to fear, which results in punishment. Lack of perfect love leads to fear, which results in punishment. This word punishment, again, he's talking to Christians, but this word punishment is only used two times in the New Testament. And it literally means torment. People who are fearful are tormented. People who've learned and are overwhelmed with the love of God and love others have been set free from that. And they can love without fear. The other place that it's used is Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. And it's used in connection with people who will spend eternity in hell. And these will go away into eternal punishment or torment. But the righteous into eternal life. We can say this, that even for the Christian, the fearful Christian creates their own hell on earth by their fear. And God never saved us to be tormented. He saved us to set us free from the torment of sin. We need to be loving God and loving others in such a way and to such a degree that there is no fear left. That the fear is driven out by our love for God when we're overwhelmed with His love for us. The true Christian is free from sinful fear. Will we be sinfully fear, uh, fearful? Uh, yeah, we will. But we'll recognize it, we'll repent of it, and we'll do what we should have done, which is love more. The true Christian is free from sinful fear. We're free from the bondage that it brings into our lives. 
Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. A right kind of fear drives us to the Lord. The wrong kind of fear drives us into ourselves and away from God and away from others. If we're going to be the kind of Christians that impact our society, that show the love of God, then we have to let the love of God so overwhelm us that it drives out fear and we love God and we love others. There's only one reason which motivates the Christian to love. It's real short. Verse 19. We love because he first loved us. That's our motivation. We love because he first loved us. God created us as his crowning glory. He put his, his image into mankind. Even when man fell, he loved us and sent his son to die for us and redeemed us who are believers. How can we not show love? We love because he first loved us. All Christians must be noted for having a mature love, a perfect love. That, that should be what people say about us. In fact, I think it, it, it shows itself in the fact that John just makes an assumption here. His assumption is the first two words, we love. He's saying to the people he's writing to, look, we love. That's, that's who we are. We love. We love God. We love others. Keep on doing that. And the only reason you can do that is because God loved you first. It's just a matter of fact. We love. Christian love should just be just a way of life for us. That'll be who we are. Well, they're, the, they're the most loving people I've seen. Can we say that in our PC society, that people are still loving? Or are they just nice today? I don't even know. Can't keep up with the PC movement. Um, but the Bible says we're to be loving. Loving God and loving others. Christians are motivated by God's complete love for them. God's love wasn't halfway done for us. God's love was not incomplete. It was not insincere. It was genuine and it was complete. God first loved us. God first loved us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows, some of your translations say, demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us first. We didn't love him first. We couldn't love him first. He loved us first. Augustine wrote this, translated into English, obviously. Never should we have found strength to love God, except as we received such love from him who had loved us before. And because he had loved us before, and without such a love, what good could we do? Or how could we not do good with such love? See, the, the exclusion comes in this way. Before we were in Christ, we could not do good because we did not have the love of God. Once we come to Christ, how can we do bad because we have the love of God? If we're overwhelmed with the love of God, it will flow out of us. So I want to conclude with just by giving you a couple of different thoughts. And with this, we'll conclude. But the love of God, are you, are you overwhelmed with it yet? Does it flow out of your life naturally? God's love is, and I just wrote down five things that quickly came to mind with some scripture references. God's love is unmerited. None of us deserved it. We didn't earn it. It was totally unmerited. There was nothing in us that he should love us. He just chose to. He just chose to do that. 
You can look up the verses later for yourself. His love is sacrificial. For God so loved the world that he gave. His love is sacrificial. God's love is comforting. He comforts those he draws to himself. He doesn't leave us tormented. He comforts us. God's love is unchanging. What's going to separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Because his love never changes. And his love is purposeful. His love is purposeful. God doesn't love us in the abstract. He loves us in the concrete purpose of his eternal plan. He loves us. Now, as a Christian, here's your homework assignment. In what ways are you demonstrating God's love? And the reason I only give you five, search the scriptures to find God's love and then write it down. I've given you these five. How are you demonstrating love this way? If you are to abide in the love of God and he is abiding in you and you are abiding in him, then you have the capacity and the ability to love the same way he did. How are you loving people who don't merit your love? How are you loving sacrificially? Not, not just are you, specifics. How are you doing that? How are you comforting those who need comfort? Is your love unchanging? Or does your spouse not know which person he or she's waking up with? What kind of a person are you? Does your love flip-flop, or is it constant and consistent? Is it purposeful? Not for your own purposes, but for the good of them. Are you building them up in love? How are you doing that? If you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I, I want to invite you to that first. The love of God needs to overwhelm you, and the the time and place that it starts to overwhelm you is when you get convicted of your sin. When you realize that there's nothing in you that God should love you, but that He does. He does. And He sent His Son to pay the penalty for sins. And that you need to submit to Him. If you've never done that, I would love to share with you how you can come to know Jesus Christ. And Christian, if the love of God is not permeating your life and, and flowing out of your life, and if you're not living a consistent, loving life, I want to encourage you to repent of that. Turn from that and begin to live the consistent, loving life that God's called you to. Would you stand with me and we'll be dismissed in prayer. Father, we, again, we thank you for the privilege we have of knowing you. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would be overwhelmed with your love, that it would flow out of us to those who maybe desperately need our love and are, in our minds, unlovable, and yet we need to show them the love of Christ. Thank you, Father, for those who shared the love of Christ with us. Thank you, Father, for being patient with us and kind to us and forgiving to us that if we confess our sins you are faithful and you are just and you will forgive cleanse us father i thank you lord for your great grace your goodness to us you're patient with us you discipline those you love you chastise every person you call a son so that we can be more like jesus christ and father i thank you for just all that you're doing and all that you are. You are a great God and you are greatly to be praised and we worship you. Continue to do a work in your church and in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name.